Good morning. Welcome back to the second in our actually eighth series with the Smithsonian. Uh, still looking into the mind of the criminal, mind of the betrayer. Um, and so I know that uh, towards the end of our lecture, I think last time, uh, it tripped over into Mr. Edward Snowden. So we may or may not be able to avoid that today. We will see. It's obviously been a lively topic, and it, it has uh, divided people to a degree in this country. Uh, our speaker this morning has appeared here before and on a similar subject, and he has spent his career studying the criminal mind, the misbehaving mind, if you will. Dr. Stanton Samenow, uh, here in Alexandria. Uh, he was a graduate of Yale and got his PhD from the University of Michigan. And then from 1970 to 1978, he was here at St. Elizabeth's for the program for the investigation of criminal behavior. And this was the longest in-depth clinical research treatment study of offenders ever conducted in North America. I should say, by the way, he was not under study. He was a research psychologist with the program. We'll keep that clear. OK, fine. I, now, it's early. You know, we like to clarify these for our speakers. Uh, the findings were published as the criminal personality. He then entered private practice in Alexandria, specializing in the evaluation and treatment of juvenile and adult offenders. He has lectured, given training courses and seminars all over the United States, Canada, and England. He has been a consultant and expert witness for the FBI, Dade County Public Schools, Federal Bureau of Prisons, and the U.S. Office of Probation. He published a book in 1984, which was updated in 2004, Inside the Criminal Mind. Uh, he frequently has appeared on radio and TV, uh, published another book, Straight Talk About Criminals, in 1998. Uh, and finally, uh, he did do a book, and this seems to be more and more significant in today's society. He published a book called Before It's Too Late, Why Some Kids Get Into Trouble and What Parents Can Do About It, published in 1989, again in 1999. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to have you here as part of this series, so please help me welcome Dr. Stanton Samenow. Well, good morning, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Ernest and Amanda Olke, who is the person who I've been dealing with on some of the details. I can speak for three days on the topic of the criminal mind, and I have actually done that. You are being spared, and I'm going to look at my watch so that we have time for questions. The topic is, does the evil mind exist? And as you know, evil is not a psychological diagnosis. At the end of this talk, you tell me, does the evil mind exist? Whenever a bizarre or seemingly out of character or horrendous crime occurs, the human mind tries to make sense of what happened. And I do get calls frequently from TV and radio stations and other media outlets asking me to conjecture why the person who is alleged to be the offender might have done what he or she did, and also, why is this person that way? The why question bedevils us with respect to the criminal mind as it does about so many other aspects of life. I can take anybody in this room, including you, Mr. Ernest, or myself, or my wife, or anyone, and if you had committed crimes, I could find some adversity in your life or mine upon which to blame it, because after all, who has not known adversity. The fact of the matter is, almost everything but the federal deficit has been blamed for criminal behavior. And I have a huge file when I give longer presentations. And I talk about, at length, which I will not do today, the conventional wisdom about why people turn to crime. But I do want to say a few things about this. 
the environment as a cause of crime, you name it, it's because you grew up poor in the inner city or you grew up with affluenza in the suburbs. Some of you may not know that term, but it was in a recent case where a youngster, the lawyer contended, was suffering from affluenza. If I recall correctly, he was drunk and he hit somebody, maybe, I, I don't remember if he killed her or not, and they said, well, it's because he grew up in a very affluent environment and his parents were too busy to set limits, etc." So, whatever background you're from, you can find some adversity on which to blame your behavior. In the study that Mr. Ernest mentioned at St. Elizabeth's Hospital that was started in 1961 by Dr. Samuel Yokelson, who died in 76, and on January 30th of 1970, I joined him in that study. One of the criminals in that study said to Dr. Yokelson, after a few years, Doctor, if I didn't have enough excuses for crime before psychiatry, I certainly have enough now after all these years. Because Dr. Yokelson started, as I did, believing in the conventional wisdom that people turn to crime because of the environment in which they grew up, because of the kind of parenting to which they were exposed, because of peer pressure, and any number of other factors. I want to just take a couple of examples. By the way, there's one this morning in the paper where Attorney General Eric Holder stated that if felons don't have their voting rights restored, that might make some of them commit more crimes. This is the absurdity of the environmental excuse, except he's already providing one beforehand. Now, let's talk about something you hear about all the time, and that is violence in the media. That kids and adults turn to crime because of violence on television, violence in the movies, and violent video games. Well, it's true. A lot of people spend a lot of time watching violence. And in fact, if you've been to the movies lately and seen the previews, there are very few films that don't have violence. And as you may know, this very institution, the International Spy Museum, had a celebration of 50 years of James Bond, movies that are filled with violence. Needless to say, millions of people have seen these films and they have not turned to crime. In fact, violence on television and in the movies and violent video games. For most people, it's just entertainment. The idea that a person is transformed into a violent person by what he or she watches just doesn't square with the facts. There was a case decades ago in Florida. Ronnie Zamora was the defendant, and his attorney tried to use the defense not guilty by reason of television. That failed. Now, it is true, however, that for many violent offenders, men who have murdered, that they have played violent video games. But it doesn't work both ways because, and, and there are copycat crimes, there's no question about it, but for every person who has copied a crime, millions of people watched the same program, played the same games, and they did not imitate that which they saw. In fact, it would be the furthest thing from their minds. So we looked at so many features of or so many of these theories about causes in the St. Elizabeth study, which went on from 61 to 78, and of course I've been seeing offenders ever since. And we end up with saying, if we don't know, let's say we don't know. There are a lot of aspects of the human condition that we do not know the cause or causes of. Now, you may think, well, he really believes it's genetic. Well, there's always that possibility. And you may remember that it was not politically correct to even breathe such a statement not so long ago. Now, a Dr. Adrian Rain has written a book about the biology of violence, and he says, and this is a quote, criminals have broken brains. 
I mean, he says a lot more, and it's a scientific book. And yet, he acknowledges that there are people who have some of the same brain pathology, but they are not criminals. So, in the original study, and even now, what I had to do was to take a scratch-on-the-table approach. You don't know why the table is scratched. You don't know how it got that way. But you don't need to know. You need to know what the table is made up of so that you can make decisions about the table. And so it was. We put the causal question on the shelf, saying we don't know why. But let's try to understand the mentality of the criminal, to understand the world from his point of view. And I'm going to use the word, the pronoun he and his, but the patterns are the same with females. So it was how does this mind work from day to day? So what I want to do is to give you a brief tour inside the criminal mind to tell you how this mind functions. But do not get a case of medical student's disease. Because as I describe some of these thinking patterns, you're going to say, my son does some of these things. My husband does some of these things. I do some of these things. Sam and has just made a criminal out of 99% of the population. As I talk to you about certain thinking patterns, bear in mind the notion of a continuum. First of all, even before we get to that, the word criminal. You could say, well, you could be a criminal in Washington, D.C. today, but not tomorrow if the law changes. Criminality is defined by the law. Well, what I have been dealing with in my career goes way beyond laws, and it's to minds. How do people live their lives? The man who said, if rape were legalized today, I wouldn't rape, but I'd do something else. Because for him, to be someone in this world is to do the forbidden, whatever the forbidden might be. So, back to the continuum. Lying. Well, it doesn't take 16 years of the taxpayer, 17 years of the taxpayer's money. This was a federally funded study so many years ago to tell you that criminals lie, but a lot of people lie who aren't criminals. The two-year-old knocks over the milk and points to the cat. The cat did it. I ask you, how do you like this tie? And you think it's hideous, but you say, it's a nice tie, because what's the point in getting into it over the tie? Or you call in and you say you're sick, but you're taking a mental health day. So people do things like that. I would submit to you there is a huge difference between the person who tells the occasional lie and the person who lies as a way of life. I'm now talking about a person who will tell you he went to McDonald's when he went to Subway. He'll tell you he rode in a green Ford, whereas it was a red Chrysler. Lies roll off his tongue as automatically as he breathes, and then people in my field psychology and related field psychiatry want to turn it into a compulsion or a disease. They'll talk about pathological lying, compulsive lying. The people I deal with, you have to understand why the purposeless lie has a purpose. And you can only do that if you understand how they think. So these are individuals who can tell the truth, believe me. And what they'll do is stare at you and me and give us 20% of the truth and lead us to think they're being truthful people and the rest of the lying is usually by omission, what they leave out. So by telling a lie that seems purposeless, the purpose is that by lying there is a sense of power. They preserve a view of themselves. Pulling the wool over the eyes of other, others leads them to think that they are unique, that they are superior. So as I talk to you about several of these thinking patterns, and there are a number of them, and we don't have uh, time to go into all of them, but just to give you the flavor of it. If you don't keep in mind the continuum, then you will get a case of medical student's disease. Power and control. There's nothing wrong with it. It's how you pursue it and how you use it if you have it. A policeman has legitimate authority. If you have a person with a criminal personality who becomes a policeman, then you have problems. Then you have the officer who will accept bribes. Then you have the officer who will arrest a motorist and 
tell her that if she, she will have sex with him, he won't give her the ticket. You'll have the officer who won't get along with others on the police force, the officer who uses excessive force. So legitimate power and control is misused by this officer with a criminal personality. Parenthetically, I might say to you that in the original study, when we asked uh, our adult males, when you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Many of them, a significant number, said a law enforcement officer. Why? Because it was the uniform, the fast police cruiser, the gun, the authority to get the bad guys off the street. Now, that doesn't mean that most policemen are criminals. It means that most policemen are not that way. But if you get one of these individuals that I'm talking about, they will misuse power and control because they want it for their own sake. The man who said, when I walk into a room, and he's talking about a break and entry, everything in that room belongs to me. That is not a mental illness. He knows he's in a house that is not his. He looks at the laptop computer, the jewelry, the flat screen TV. In his mind, all these items already belong to him. All he has to do is to figure out how to get them out of there and then how to dispose of them. There is this sense of ownership and entitlement to the extreme. These are individuals who see themselves as unique. Well, everybody is unique, physically, psychologically, and experientially. But these individuals believe they're unique in the sense that they are better than others, superior to others, that nobody could ever understand them. If you have nine of these people on a baseball team, each of them thinks he's the captain, or ought to be. And if not, he's either going to quit or stick around and make life miserable for others. There is no concept of interdependence. Every one of these individuals has to be in charge. And his very sense of who he is depends on that. To tell you that they lack a concept of injury to others may appear to state the obvious. If you were to ask some of the people I deal with, who was hurt by what you did? You would get answers like, well, I know the guy missed his stuff, but I have to do the time. You would hear them blame the victim. If you saw how that woman was dressed walking on that street, she was asking for something. And a kid might say, well, you know, if he wanted to keep his jacket, he wouldn't have left the locker open. There is no concept of the ripple effect of injury, the stone in the pond, and the concentric circles of injury that ripple not only to the direct victim, but the indirect victim. Example, a boy that I saw in the Prince William County Juvenile Detention Center. He and a friend, uh, he, he had worked at a restaurant part-time, so he knew the schedule. And he knew that late at night, they tallied up the receipts and made up the depository for the bank. So he and a friend came into that restaurant just prior to closing, ski masks, gun, rope, tied up the two women who were counting up the receipts, made off with the money, stole a car, and left. The next morning, one of these kids, the one I was talking to, in the detention center came back to the restaurant. And, and of course, there's a different shift on in the morning. And he said, hey, I heard you guys were held up. Is everybody all right? When I asked him who was hurt, he said nobody. He said there was no blood. There were no broken bones. Nobody got shot. And when I said to him, did it ever occur to you that for those two women, life may never be the same again? That in a place that they thought they were safe, that they had gone to, to work, no longer a safe place. Who knows whether these women will ever even want to go out to work again, or even to leave their house the effect on their families, on their friends, and on the other businesses in the neighborhood before you were caught. He just looked at me, kind of wide-eyed and shrugged, and said, well, I never thought of all that. 
Well, of course, had he thought of all that, it's highly likely I wouldn't have been having that discussion because he wouldn't have been where he was. These are individuals who are very concrete thinkers. And by that, let me tell you what I mean. On an IQ test, they could tell you that an apple and an orange are similar because they're both fruit, you know, an abstract category. But they do not have a concept, for example, of a parent as a human being. A parent is somebody who's on your case or who's somebody who will let you do what you want to do. And there's the good parent and the bad parent. And I remember, this is not unusual, but I'm thinking of one kid who was in the Arlington County Detention Center. He described his mother in the most reverent terms. This was a mother who had stood by him whenever he had gotten into trouble. She visited him in the detention center. She had given him many chances before. She went to church and prayed for him. And so in his view, she was perfect. When he got out of the detention center and came back home again, things went well for a while, and then there was the music being played till 2 in the morning, people coming around to the basement window to buy drugs. And when she started to question him, then this revered mother became a total adversary, and she was cursed at and screamed as, it, at, as if she were the vilest creature on the face of the earth. These are individuals, many of them have told me how religious they are. They will go to church. They will wear a cross around their neck. They will read the Bible. However, there is no concept of religion as a guide to life. It is a set of concrete observances. Thus, you pray at 10 and you commit an armed robbery at 1.30. The Mafia are religious, in quotes. They have shrines in their own homes. They give money to legitimate organized charities. That doesn't stop them from blowing the heads off their adversaries. So when I say they're concrete thinkers, it has nothing to do with intelligence because many of them are highly intelligent. Even if their IQ scores are not in the superior range, you look at how they function in daily life. You know, when I'm interviewing one of these men, women, or youngsters, there are always two evaluations going on. I am evaluating them, but they are also evaluating me. They are sizing me up as they have others, teachers, parents, counselors, for their own purposes, to achieve their own objectives. You've heard a lot said about um, kids who commit school shootings being loners. Well, let's talk about that word just for a moment. The way it's often presented is that they are ostracized by others and that because they are ostracized, they build up a lot of anger and they build up a lot of resentment and they then take it out on others in these crimes that they commit. Well, that really is not so much the story. You may remember uh, the Columbine shootings, Keebold and Harris. These were individuals who detested, looked down on, spewed contempt toward the more conforming students, the athletes, various ethnic groups. They dressed Keebold and Harris in a certain style. They, in fact, set themselves apart from the mainstream students in their high school. It wasn't so much that they were shunned as they shunned others who were afraid to approach them, who were fearful of them, and really didn't want much to do with them. So they are loners in the sense that love, loyalty, trust, friendship, these are antithetical to the person with a criminal mind. Trust, that word, they'll use it, but what they often mean is that the person won't snitch or inform on them. There is, as you know the phrase, there is no loyalty among thieves. One will rat the other out if he thinks it will serve his advantage. In terms of love, and I don't purport to be the person to define love, but certainly love requires 
a certain reciprocity, a certain mutuality, give and take. These are individuals who are very, very practiced at taking, but they give very little unless they think that it's going to serve their purpose at the moment. Relationships are a one-way street, and it must be on their terms, their way. These people want to prevail and are determined to prevail in every situation. Any means to an end, deceit, intimidation, or brute force. And yet, if we only conceived of individuals with a criminal mind as being uncompromising, pursuing power and control for their own sake, sensing themselves to be unique, lacking a concept of injury to others, lacking any concept of interdependence, we would miss the part that makes this personality so complicated, so interesting to writers and movie makers. It's the soft side. It's the sentimental side, the fearful side. Such people can be very, very sentimental. One man said, I can turn from tears to ice like that and back again. You may remember, if you read the book, I don't recall if it was in the movie, in Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, Perry puts a pillow under the head of one of the Clutter family members to make him more comfortable before he snuffs out his life. A man who refused to step on a bug, he was a murderer, mind you, committed homicide. He wouldn't step on a bug because he didn't want to kill a living thing. People who are maudlinly sentimental when it comes to helping elderly people across the street or with their groceries, they may turn misty-eyed over babies and yet commit horrendous acts of violence. So sentimentality and brutality reside side by side within the same individual. These are very fearful people. Of course, they don't talk about their fears because to do so would mean that they were lame, sissy, or weak, to use their language. So what are their fears? You could take the toughest guy in the Fairfax County Adult Detention Center, if you could determine who that was, and if you asked him, well, didn't you ever think you'd get caught? He would reply, of course, but not this time. They know the occupational hazards of crime, the external deterrence, that they could get caught, convicted, confined, injured, or killed in a high-risk crime. But they can do something with these fears that most of us in this room cannot do and have no reason to do. They can shut those fears off just like that, like you could turn off a light switch with just enough fear returning to look over their shoulder for the police or anyone who will hold them accountable. And even then, for those who are on, who are on high doses of mind-altering substances, as one said, well, fear knocks off my caution. So they are afraid of getting caught, convicted, confined, injured, or killed. There are also fears of conscience. And you might say, well, do they have a conscience? Well, rather than saying they don't have a conscience, it is more accurate to say that they have a rather tattered and threadbare conscience. There are elements of conscience. So one man broke into a home and cleaned out the person's apartment of treasured heirlooms. When he learned that she was suffering from a terminal illness, he was so remorseful, he arranged to have these items all brought back to her. So you see, he was able to experience that. But it did not stop him from breaking into others' homes in the future. So the ability to shut off elements of conscience is there. The greatest fear of all by these individuals is the fear of being put down. 
What is a put down? If you say to me, attending this talk this morning was the worst waste of time, rather than my taking it as an indictment of myself as a human being, I might turn to you and ask you and say, well, how could it have been better? And I might learn something from your criticism. If I determine that you have made up your mind before you came in, well, you have a right to do that. This is not about me. A put down to a criminal is anything that does not go according to his assumptions and his expectations. Murphy's Law, that if anything can go wrong, it will. And a probation officer in Minnesota told me about Sullivan's corollary, and that is Murphy is an optimist. <laughs> but in the person with a criminal personality, there is no room for Murphy much less Sullivan. It's, I think, therefore it is. Thinking makes it so. So, for example, uh, a man, is, uh, let's use an example of a kid who's in a juvenile detention center. And the counselor says, well, Robert, staff is going to have a meeting today, and we're going to decide whether you are ready for class B privileges, which would give him a lot more freedom. In Robert's mind, it's a done deal. So, and he's already thinking about how he's going to use the privilege or maybe even exploit it. So when the staff member comes back and begins by saying, Robert, the staff thought you had made a lot of progress, but this is like sticking a pin in a balloon. His whole self-image is on the line because this is not what he expected. These are individuals who have totally unrealistic expectations. How many probation officers have heard their clients say, I can't get a job? Now, it is true that in a tight job market, jobs are maybe not so hard to find. I mean, they are hard to find, but the probation officer may say, well, have you tried fast food? So his client says, the criminal says, I'd rather be dead than have somebody see me putting up French fries or hamburgers. In his mind, if he's going to work at McDonald's, he should be a regional manager, not sweep the floor or cook hamburgers, despite the fact that he is a high school dropout and has no job experience. So for the probation officer, even to suggest that he have such a job, that is a put down. And when I say a put down, it's global. My analogy of sticking a pin in a balloon and the whole balloon popping. So think of it this way. If every day from the time you got up until the time you went to bed, you expected everything to go the way you wanted, that when you got on Metro, that you would get a seat, Metro would run on time, when you got to work, that everybody would be glad to see you, that the people who were supposed to see you would be on time, that when you went home and you went to pick up your car, that it would be ready from the repair place, and everything fixed correctly the first time and at a reasonable price, and that when you got home, everybody would be glad to see you and you'd have a nice, tranquil evening. Now, I'm, of course, drawing a ridiculous set of expectations, but quite frankly, this is how the criminal mind operates. And I remember a lawyer who had been charged with several crimes, and I was, as a part of his probation, I was counseling him, and he told me that when he got home, he said he didn't think he should have to do anything but sit in his chair and watch television. Now, you might say, well, there are a lot of people like that. But this is how he approaches everything, everything. And it is an insult to suggest otherwise. And the reaction to a put down is anger. As one man said, I don't get mad, I get even these individuals simmer with anger all the time at a world that from their point of view does not give them their due. And so then you hear about the assault that occurred and sometimes they don't even know what triggered it. Two kids are walking down a hallway, one looks at the other a certain way and you have a fight on your hands. Someone looks at someone in a certain manner and a fight starts. And I had recently a woman I was counseling, she went to Walmart 
and she was in a hurry. So she had her cart, and there was this couple, and they were shopping, and they were in the aisle, and she was in a hurry, and she was rushing toward them, and they didn't move. She screamed a curse word at them, and they just stared at her, and she banged her cart into the cart of the other person, knocked the woman down, all of this in front of the, uh, the camera, the surveillance camera. She was charged with assault and battery. She's in jail now as we speak because these people didn't get out of the way. She was offended. Now, there was a lot more going on in her life, of course, than that. But what was going on in her life was irresponsibility at work and her boss putting her on probation. There were bills that were overdue. So it was anger, anger, anger based on the consequences of her own irresponsibility. And so this was the one thing too much. This fear of a put-down is critically important to know about, no matter what capacity you deal with a criminal. I'm still here. I've dealt with people from death row on down. Our home phone number and address are in the phone book. They always have been. And knock on wood, we have not had any problems so far. And I think that is because I understand who I'm dealing with. I understand very well that these are individuals who have a glass jaw. They will dish it out, but they will not take it. And although you could say that, I mean, you might say to me, well, do you like these people or do you hate these people? It's not a matter of liking or hating. There's a job to be done. And when I talk to an offender, the same tone and style I'm using right here is what I use, not with the volume, obviously. And so I speak with respect and I am forthright. I am very aware that the tone and style of what I say is critically important. I could say, well, John, I have the pre-sentence report from your probation officer, and I know you've been caught for three counts of, or charged with three counts of grand larceny, but I'll bet that if we had a film of your life, there'd be a lot more than that. Or I could say, well, John, I know you've been charged with three counts of grand larceny. Your probation officer sent the report over. And I don't want to go into details of other crimes, but let's just talk about if we had a DVD of your life, wouldn't it be the case that there are other illegal acts, other thefts that you have committed, but you've not been caught for them? Same thing but said in very different tone. All right, so this, uh, oh, two other points I want to make, and then I have some things to say about the so-called out-of-character crime. These men, women, and children do know right from wrong, no doubt about it. As one said, I can make anything wrong right, I can make anything wrong, right wrong. Right is what I want to do at the time. How do you have a discussion of right and wrong with somebody like that? And what to me, and I can go all the way back to working with Dr. Yokelson at St. Elizabeth's, the one feature that surprised me more than anything else, and I know you distrust, and rightfully so, any statement that begins with every, but this is the only statement I will make that has every in it. Every offender whom I have interviewed, every, no exceptions, regards himself or herself as a good human being. You might say, well, how does a one-man walking crime wave retain the view of himself as a good guy? Well, there are many components to this. One is that many of them do go to school. Many of them do work, so they're good people. There's a lot of talent in this population, artistic talent, musical talent, some of them can fix anything. They can craft things with their hands. They're good people. Some of them give money to organize charities. They'll do a good deed. They'll help somebody across the street. I already referred to their, quote, religious observance. All of these are components. And then there's this. 
It's what the other guy does. He's the criminal. So, a 16-year-old who said to me, anybody that knocks a little old lady down on the street and takes her purse, he should be strung up. But he himself broke into a woman's apartment while she was there, terrorized her, and made off with some very valuable possessions. But that was okay, because he didn't knock her down on the street. And the guy who says, well, anybody who messes with kids, he should be put away forever. So it's what the other person does, and that he says he wouldn't do. All of this is part of this view of the self as a good person, which is critically important. Police officers make use of this. In fact, I'm involved in a case, and I can't talk about it. It's not yet come to trial in Fairfax County, but the detective did what detectives often do. And he said to the defendant, he said, look, I'm not saying you're a bad guy. You know, you're, you're a good person, but you know, people make mistakes. So, and then he goes on and talks to him. So he, the, the detective is using his knowledge of the criminal's view of himself as a good person to try to make the interviewing process easier. There's also another huge ramification of this particular feature. If one is trying to counsel and work with such a person in the process of change, my job is not to comfort the afflicted, but it is to afflict the comfortable. You see people, and what I mean by that is this, some people will say, well look, the core problem here, being very psychological, is low self-esteem. They failed at work, not all of them, but many. They failed at school, they failed socially, they failed in their families, and they've even failed at crime because they've been arrested. That is not how they see themselves at all. From our standpoint, they may be failures, but that is not their view. In fact, as they're sitting there being interviewed, it's anything but low self-esteem because they're looking at the detective or the psychologist or the psychiatrist as their adversary. How are they going to overcome them? They're looking down their noses at them. With the exception of a person who perhaps has never been caught before, this is the first time, and then he is fearful. Nonetheless, in working with an individual, it is not to build his self-esteem. It is to do what none of us like to do for very long, to look at ourselves in the mirror, to see the things that are minuses about ourselves, to see the ramifications of those, and then to make changes. So with this person, who sees himself as number one and superior, our job is not to build his self-esteem. Self -esteem. Where do drugs come into this? And I understand that to talk about drugs in maybe a minute and a half gives the subject short shrift. Offenders will say, I didn't commit the crime, the drugs did it. I've heard that many times. Or I'm not really a criminal. I don't even belong here if they're in jail. You know, it was, it was the drugs that did it. And I remember this woman who said, you know, my boyfriend left me, I had my baby, I had no money, I had to get formula, I had to get diapers, so I knew where I could get some PCP, fencyclidine, and I knew where I could sell it. But you know, I'm a good mother. I did what I had to do to take care of my child. Well, what did she expect of this low-life boyfriend that she was associated with? That he was going to stick around and support this kid? What about her parents who warned her, not only about the boyfriend, but about living this whole way of life that she had chosen? And then, one does not have to go out and peddle drugs to get diapers and formula for a baby in the United States of America. She was living a certain way, she was a thief, she was a liar, and she had committed offenses before that, but had not been caught. So drugs are not the problem. As one of the men in the St. Elizabeth study said, 
retrospectively, it's thugs, not drugs. It's thinking, not drinking. Drugs only bring out what already resides within the person. If 10 men get drunk, 10 men are not going to go rape a woman. What happens is in line with their personality. It takes about one and a half drinks for me to feel an effect and maybe less, and I can assure you I would not be going out raping or stealing or anything like that. In fact, I might get rather tired and, uh, or I might get more talkative, and that's about it. However, for the individual with a criminal personality, drugs facilitate whatever it is that he wants. Either bigger and more daring crimes, because drugs knock out deterrence. Sexual conquests, one man said, with a, with a woman it's 50-50, but on drugs she's a sure thing. Because on drugs, depending on the drug and how much, he would be emboldened to approach her, he would be less discriminating in his choice of partners, and he would take greater risks. Or, of course, people use drugs for things other than sexual conquests or crimes, and it's the mind-expanding aspect of it. On drugs, I felt I could do anything. On drugs, I felt 10 feet tall. So it's enhanced power, bigger and more daring crimes, sexual conquests, or, of course, if a person is in search of a religious experience with certain drugs, he may have that. But the content of that is that he's more godlike than in touch with God. So even there, the criminal features prevail. So let's talk for a few minutes about the so-called out-of-character crime. How often you read in the paper, he was a good man. He had no criminal record. He was a deacon in the church. He had a steady employment record. It didn't seem as if it were possible that he could have done what he did. I would submit to you there is no such thing as an out-of-character crime. This podium will not fly. It is not in its character to fly. We do what is in character. Now, when a person commits a crime, it doesn't mean that it is necessarily premeditated, and I'm thinking of a child custody case in Arlington some years ago where a man and his wife were separated and it was one of these awful child custody cases and I am embroiled in some of the most adversarial child custody cases in Northern Virginia and there was a lot of hatred and this man was afraid that his soon-to-be ex-wife would seek custody of their son and move out of state with him. And furthermore, she had a boyfriend. So he was simmering with rage for years, several years. And then one day, he had to take some papers over to her. When I say for years, even before they separated, they had these battles back and forth over everything. So then one day, he went over to her house, asked her to sign some papers. I think they were tax papers. Followed her into the kitchen, picked up a knife, and stabbed her to death. He didn't plan the date and time and place. But in his mind, many times he had killed her. Many times he had fantasized her dead. And in their relationship, which was stormy, there was a lot of verbal abuse. He had thrown things at her. So this didn't just happen out of the blue. Lee Boyd Malvo, the younger of the two Washington snipers. You may remember it was the defense's contention that he was suffering from what they called a dissociative disorder, and he pled not guilty by reason of insanity. What the defense argued was that Malvo's mind was like, and they use this analogy, a pristine clear stream that was contaminated by the muddy waters of the older John Muhammad's influence. That he was brainwashed. That was the argument. Lee Boyd Malvo was a criminal before he ever met John Muhammad. And by the way, I can talk about the case. Testimony is a matter of public record, and it was widely covered by the press, so there's no divulgence here of confidentiality. Well, he was only 17 
when he, with Muhammad, committed the homicides and the other shootings. But before that, well before that, he was a thief and a liar. He stole from his own mother. He and some other kids constantly would go into stores and they would be uh, customers who would buy tapes and become known to the shopkeepers and then they would go in and case the place out and because they were already known they would make off with tapes and steal them. Numerous acts of, of theft. He had a grudge against a kid for a couple of years and one day picked up a metal trash can and beat him with it. Most people, if they met John Muhammad, would have run the other way. Ah, but they said, he was in search of a father figure because his mother, Una James, wouldn't let him see his father and that he was a boy who was yearning to see his father and Muhammad filled the bill. Well, as Lee Boyd Malvo himself told me, growing up in matriarchal Jamaica, most of his friends grew up with homes in which the father was not present. So having a bad childhood hardly explains what Lee Boyd Malvo did. There are thousands and thousands of children without fathers in their lives. There are children who don't have any biological parents in their lives. They don't commit mass murder. So he became not only, he was not only a person who embraced Muhammad, but he was an eager student and he learned from him. Now you may say, well, if he had never met Muhammad, perhaps all of these shootings would not have occurred and that's possible. I mean, we don't know. But to say that he was contaminated and turned into somebody other than what he was does not square with the facts and the jury didn't buy it. He was found guilty in that trial in Chesapeake, Virginia. One other case, very quickly. You may remember, and again, this is a matter of public record. I testified uh, for the prosecution. You may remember this horrible case at Tyson's Corner. The grandmother who picked up her three-year-old granddaughter and threw her over the railing up, I think it was on the sixth level at Tyson's and the little girl died. And uh, she pled insanity. And I'll grant you, people instinctively would say, well, you have to be nuts to do that. What grandmother would even think of it, much less do it? She had to be crazy. And of course, the jury would have to get by that, I suppose. Uh, if that's what they thought, I mean, they have to come in with an open mind. This grandmother was one of the most self-centered individuals that I have met, and I have met a lot. She didn't get along with her own son. Her son would really have nothing to do with her as he grew up. The father and son interacted. She had constant conflict with her husband demanding at times that he stay home with her and at other times saying he should leave the house. The turmoil was such that at one point she pulled a knife on her husband. And then when her daughter became pregnant out of wedlock, this was the final blow. Oh, I, I left out one other fact. While her husband was a conscientious government worker, she was out spending, 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 plunging them into debt, hiding her clothes in the closet, clothes hanging up with price tags that were never worn. And so there was the financial irresponsibility, there was the failure really to be any kind of a decent parent to this son, there was the constant demanding uh, of things on her terms with the husband. And then when the daughter got pregnant out of wedlock, that was the final straw because it ruined her dream of what her daughter should have. Now, that might be true with many people, but listen to how far it went. She wanted nothing to do with the daughter, and as far as the father of this child, because obviously her daughter had the baby, 
She would have nothing to do with him whatsoever. She spewed hatred toward him. So this was a woman who hated anyone and everyone that did not fall in line with her plans and what she wanted. So what happened, and there's a lot more to this. Oh, she was in therapy. Well, you know, any time a criminal defendant is in therapy, automatically people start thinking, well, he was in therapy or she was in therapy, so there must have been something wrong. Well, she used her therapist the way she used everybody else. And that is when things weren't going her way, she'd go in and complain and want medication. When things were going fine, then she didn't see the therapist. So she began to resent not only her daughter and the father of the baby, but the baby herself. When she was interviewed by the detective, they didn't need the mental health professionals. All they needed was the interview, the videotape of the interview. She never asked how the granddaughter was, because you see, she didn't know whether the granddaughter had survived the fall or not. She never asked, never asked. And then she told the detective, there was no room for me in their lives. She was jealous of this baby. And while she had been in the inner courtyard where the little train is and uh, they had had a snack, she had the thought in there and the thinking was going on about getting rid of this little girl. It didn't just happen at the spur of the moment on some impulse. So there was thinking before she did what she did. So don't think for a minute that this was a wonderful, loving grandmother who just got caught up and did something out of character. And so this is what I found. There is no such thing as the out of character crime. It means that there's a lot that wasn't known about the person, even by people who thought they knew the individual well. One last statement before I open it to questions. And you may say, well, is there any hope? I mean, do you just lock people up and throw the key away? With some, yeah. I mean, there are people who will resist and reject any attempt to help them. The term rehabilitation, you know, the pendulum has gone back and forth in this country from you can rehabilitate anyone if you give them enough love, enough therapy, and spend enough money to the opposite, nothing works, forget it. Well, the idea that if you look up the word rehabilitate in the dictionary, it means to restore to an earlier constructive state or condition. You help rehabilitate a stroke victim, help her regain functions she once had, rehabilitate an old building, restore it to its former elegance. There is nothing to which to rehabilitate these individuals. The scope of the task is much bigger. It's more than job training. It's more than social skills. It's more than a GED because behavior is a product of thinking. Proverbs, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So any attempt to help individuals reform, it is habilitation, not rehabilitation, and it is to help some people under certain circumstances beyond the scope of our time today to reach them at a time when there's some vulnerability, to start to hold a mirror up to that person, to describe him to himself, and to try to engage him in a process, no quick fixes, no quick fixes, to help him become aware of his errors in thinking, the ramifications of them, and to learn correctives. And that can be done in some cases. Certainly you would not be doing it in the community with violent criminals, but there are people for whom this process uh, is certainly uh, useful and worthwhile. Questions, comments? Thank you so much for a very stimulating presentation. By <clears throat> I don't know about you, I feel I just earned three graduate stool credits. And... <laughs> okay, why don't we start right back there. I mean, up all the way in the back, right there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for your presentation. I certainly learned a great deal. Uh, here in the district where I live, there is the legislation before the city council to remove on uh, employment applications the box whether you have a criminal record. Have you been arrested? Have you been uh, incarcerated? Um, the proponents say that uh, people have done their time, they've paid their price to society, 
It shouldn't bar them from future employment. I was wondering if I could get your view on that legislation. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm not in agreement with that. I, think, I, I don't think have you been arrested should preclude anyone from getting a job because people are arrested and then uh, charges are disposed of. But I think in terms of have you ever been convicted of a felony, I think people who are hiring individuals need to know what they're getting. And that is one check. Uh, people are not going to come in and volunteer this information. So uh, I think that question should remain. I say that question. Have you ever been convicted of a felony with a please explain? I think it should stay. Okay. Oh. How about over here, Laura? All the way in back, right back there. Uh, yes, thank you, doctor. How, what percentage do you feel can be habilitated? It's very hard to say, and it depends on who you're talking about, because I spoke of a continuum of criminality. So, as you know, I have a practice in Alexandria, and I do see some people that I work with in the community. These are not uh, serial killers, obviously, but there are people who are arrested um, for certain types of crimes, and the court maintains a hold over them, and it may be a condition of their probation that they see somebody, and I'm the somebody in certain cases. Um, so I think that the, the process that I referred to is um, certainly uh, fits and can be used with people who are not hardcore criminals. Now, people who are repeat offenders, there are programs in this country in correctional institutions where they start to work with people with errors in thinking in the institution, which is where it should begin. And some people start and they reject it and others continue. And then when they're in the community, it needs to continue. See, one of the problems is there are problems, uh, there, there are efforts made in prison or even in the county jail in some cases. And then people are released and there's no follow up at all. Well, you can't expect a person even if he's functioning very well in the correctional facility, to function just as well in a world in which he has never functioned responsibly. So there must be ongoing follow-up. So the answer is I don't have an answer as to a percentage. Um, and I think it depends on whether you're talking about people who are fairly low level on the continuum or people who are more extreme. But it doesn't always follow that the people who are more what I'm calling low level are more amenable because the guy who's been in prison, the guy who has seen all kinds of consequences, been in and out of prison, lost his family, lost his freedom, he actually may be more open to it than somebody in the community. So the answer is you always get this from mental health professionals. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> um, how about right here? Yeah. Sir, sir, wait. wait. Yeah. Oh. There's a microphone. Um, well, you, you touched on drugs, but it's, it's also true that, you know, a person who's an addict really has a very hard time stopping, and he needs money for his drugs, uh, and whether he, would, he or she would steal from, you know, the parents or wherever, um, you know, they, they feel they have to do it. Now, it's not an excuse, but it is a problem. Okay, I have a response to that, and it is this that at least in my experience, and remember, I should, you know, I would preface every statement within my experience, I can't speak for everybody, but the person who has a drug habit, you're right, he does need money for drugs. What I have found is that these are people who have been arrestable even before they had a drug habit, and many of them will steal beyond what they need to support the drug habit. So, uh, drugs, this is a strange statement to make, but I'm going to make it and then explain it. Drugs, as I see it, are another dot on the landscape of the person's irresponsibility. In other words, every person, that's an every, I, I'd have to think about it, but certainly the overwhelming number of offenders that I've seen were irresponsible, if not arrestable, before drugs. So the issue is not the drugs per se. I do agree with you that uh, many people have great difficulty 
giving up drugs. But you know, when we talk about giving up drugs, it isn't just giving up drugs. It's giving up the whole way of life. It's the people, the places, the risks, the dangers, the intrigue. And I remember the man, never forget him, and picture him now, it was years ago, who said to me, and he was on a, a intensive probation program, he had a good job, he had a girlfriend, he had his freedom, and he was on his probation. And one day he came in and said to me, he said, you know, I thought if I stopped using drugs, and he, he was being drug screened, so he had been abstinent for a long time, he said, I thought if I gave up using drugs, I'd have no problems. He says, I have more problems now than ever before. My truck breaks down, customers complain, I have to go to this meeting, that meeting, I have bills to pay, my girlfriend wants this or that. And then he turned to me and he said, what do you have that compares with cocaine? What am I going to tell him? That going to work at McDonald's and paying the bills and keeping the gas tank filled is as exciting as that world? And I said, nothing. There's nothing that you will find as exciting in terms of the thrills and the kicks of that whole way of life. So when we talk about a person giving up drugs, it is more than just drugs. Take a next one. Okay, here, I'll take a couple up here, Amanda. Hello, sir. Thank you uh, very much for your presentation. Um, I'm retired after 30 years in the Navy, and I dealt with all sorts of young people uh, throughout the years, flotsam and jetsam, the, the best and the brightest. Um, most of the kids are just knuckleheads who got into trouble. They're risk takers. It's the age group. Um, some are criminals, and we spend a lot of time sorting that out. The quick question is, is there a test that uh, we can give people? <laughs> I, you know that I wish there were, uh, and you make a very good point. I remember once I was one on, on one of these Good Morning programs. I think it was Good Morning Louisville. And I was asked, I was given my five minutes, and I was asked about early signs of this personality developing. And I had listed uh, some of the characteristics, and the interview was over. And I realized every person watching that would probably say their kid did every one of them. Because I didn't make the point, I wasn't watching the time, I, I, and I didn't make the point, kids get into fights. Kids do dumb things. Kids try, kids, young adults, try marijuana. They're knuckleheads, to use your phrase. Uh, maybe that should be a diagnostic category as well. Um, uh, and so you don't want to swat a fly with a cannon. You're correct. And every kid who gets into a fight, a physical fight on a playground, does not become the one man walking crime wave I'm talking about. So uh, there is no test that I know of. And I really wish there were. So all I'm left with saying is, you know, if I'm talking to parents, for example, if you have a child who is showing expanding and intensifying patterns over time, it's something to be concerned about. You don't want to label little kids as criminals. You don't want to be labeling anybody, really. But certainly if you have a child who increasingly is lying, who increasingly is determined to control others by force or by deception, and whereas kids will do these things, most of them give it up and they develop a conscience. So if you have kids where these patterns are increasing and intensifying over time, you might want to try to intervene before we have the kind of person I'm talking about. So I really appreciate your question, and it goes back to one of the earlier points I made about bearing in mind a continuum from the knucklehead, I love it, great term, to the one man walking crime wave. Well, it, it sounds like the last book that you did is on precisely this topic, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and that's available at uh, that book? Right out there. Right out yep, there, the right. Myth, the, the let, me myth, take, let me take a couple more The myth of the outer character crime. Hi, uh, very interesting model of the criminal mind. I have a question about it. To what extent does it apply to white collar or financial criminals as opposed to violent criminals? 
Okay. It absolutely does apply to uh, so-called white-collar criminals, people who have committed financial crimes. If you have, I, I use this mythical DVD of their lives, you would find that these are individuals, though certainly they don't commit the financial crimes because they need the money. I mean, if they're leaving their McLean seven-bedroom house with four-car garage and their Mercedes to go to work, they're not committing financial crimes for the money. But it has to do very much with what I've been talking about, and that is the uh, sense that they are better than others, that they are unique, the power, the control, the excitement. This all applies. And in fact, what I should have said very early uh, in the talk was that these patterns that I'm des describing, the thinking processes, apply across the board. The guy who takes money um, from a, at a bank at the end of a gun, the man that rapes, the man that uh, pillages a corporation, same mentality but their tastes and preferences in crime. So the guy who uses muscle or force may look down on the white collar offender as weak, lame, sissy, and prides himself on being tough. Whereas a white collar person would look down on the street criminal as being uncouth and rough and not something that he would do. So definitely the model applies. Yes, uh, Amanda, how about back there? Right in front of you there, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm having a blank. Who killed Sharon Tate? Manson. Uh, Manson. 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 Sorry. When all of that was going on, and I was in California, and they ran his childhood uh, biography, my father had exactly the same format to his life. And yet my father spent 20 years in the military, 20 years with NASA, and was one of the fun finest, kindest men I knew. So. Where does this break? You know, that, well, that always has confused me. The well, you, you uh, underscored my point, and that is that um, when it comes to the causal question, and you know, I, I get asked a lot about this, as you would expect, because the human mind tries to make sense of experience. We try to understand why. I mean, not just with criminality, but with so many other aspects of life. So, you know, is there a bad seed? Is there a genetic aspect to this? Um, maybe, but you know what? Even if there were, I'm saying even if there were a genetic predisposition, genetics need not necessarily be destiny. And I remember a man I interviewed in the Prince William Adult Detention Center, and he had done all kinds of illegal things, and he said, one thing I didn't do was I did not drink. Now, he would have no reason to lie to me about that because he had told me about so much else. And he said, the reason I didn't drink was my father died of alcohol poisoning, well, cirrhosis of the liver. And I saw what alcohol did to him, and I wasn't going to do it. So he made a series of choices. If prostate cancer runs in your family, you don't choose to get cancer. I'm certainly not suggesting that. But if you know that there's a predisposition, then you would start having PSA tests earlier than you might otherwise. You would also take certain precautions, perhaps, with diet. And if it turned out that you did develop it at an early age, then perhaps there would be early intervention. So even there, genetics isn't destiny. It doesn't mean because it's in your family, you're going to die of it. I know, the analogy is not perfect. <laughs> OK, right back there. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, I've, I've, I've always had this question, and maybe... Could you, could you hold the mic up, please? Sure. Um, a couple of qu questions ago was you were stating about um, how children... Um, um, any, my, okay, well, this is, this is my question. Um, according to Catcher in the Rye, okay, with John Hinckley, the shooting of John Hinckley, um, of, of, of Reagan, of John Lennon, um, of uh, Rebecca Schaefer by um, Robert Brardo, Always, rec always said something about Holden Caulfield and Catcher in the Rye. And I was curious as to what your take was, because Catcher in the Rye, of course, was about the preteen, a young preteen, trying to find himself. And I was curious why these people identify themselves so much with Holden Caulfield, who they were at least 10 years older than he was at the time, you know. Um, and in this heinous crimes, and nothing was ever said or done 
by Holden, he was just trying to figure out himself as to why he, why these horrible crimes were done, and it was always the, um, the um, catcher in the rye defense. Well, I don't know that I can do <clears throat> justice to the question. I, I would say this, that probably most of us at some time in our lives are trying to find ourselves. Maybe we still are, and we go through this at different phases, and a lot of people identify with Holden Caulfield. I mean, it's a landmark classic of American literature. So I don't think that I have an answer as to why they cite Holden Caulfield. Um, I've interviewed people that cite mass murderers as being, um, I don't want to say inspirations, but being exciting for them to read about. And I don't think that there's any causal connection between what they r read about necessarily and what they do. So um, I don't have an answer for you on that. I'm sorry. It's a good question. Go ahead. Sure. Here. Um, the why question that interests me is why we think that criminals are adversely affected by their environment or are somehow mentally disturbed. And my theory is that we recognize some of these criminal instincts in ourselves and are unable to accept the concept of sane evil. So we look for some cause that will exonerate us. That is a very interesting statement. Um, people have said, um, well, you may remember um, former President Carter's interview with Playboy magazine, and he talked about there being lust in every heart and how um, people have to deal with that. People have temptations. If you go into Home Depot and you want to buy some 50 cent part to something and, and you have it in your hand and there's a long line, I'm sure people have had the thought, I could walk out of here, you know, I don't have to wait in this line, but they don't do it. There's a book, by the way, called Why Are You Not, at a, Why Are you not a Criminal? Uh, I think it was written by a professor at New Mexico State University. So why don't you walk out with the piece, the, the, the piece even if you really believed you could get out of there and nobody would know the difference? And well, some people wouldn't take it, wouldn't go out with it because they would be afraid they'd be caught. And for other people, they'd be offended by the very idea that they would take it. They couldn't live with themselves if they took it. So there are various reasons why we do not succumb to temptation. Um, as to, you know, I, was at, I was really put on the spot, I'll never forget this, Washburn University, uh, the law school in Topeka, Kansas, and somebody asked me right from the floor, well, Dr. Samenow, what would it take for you to kill somebody? You know, again, this idea that, there's, that any of us is capable of anything. And I paused, because I had never been asked that, certainly not publicly, and I said, well, you're, you know, you're talking to a guy, first of all, that was never even in a fist fight in school. I was chicken. You know, I was one of these guys that would walk away, run away, talk myself out of a situation. So responding physically to somebody is not part of who I am. But to answer his, the person's question, I said, I suppose, I mean, and I can only suppose, if I and or my wife or family were threatened in such a, physically threatened in such a manner that there was no other way than yes. So I'm not sure that um, people say, well, we're fascinated by criminals because we know that there are dark sides of ourselves. Again, I'm going to keep going back to the continuum. I think there are people in this room who couldn't kill anybody if they, unless they were practically forced to do it. I think there are a lot of people in this room who wouldn't steal from Home Depot or any other place. You can tell that Home Depot may not be my very favorite place. <laughs> um, but um, they, they wouldn't steal from Home Depot or anywhere else, no matter what the temptation. So um, that's about all I can say on that. Do you, do you know, uh, I've noticed a number of stores are now doing these self-pricing things. You carry around a device, you determine what your bill is. Do you have any idea whether this is working? It must I be. I have no idea. Be trying it. Okay. No idea. Right there, Amanda. Yeah. Uh, where does uh, uh, somebody who has a clear case of psychotic uh, a behavior, a schizophrenia, uh, fit into this thing? Okay. Um, I'm going to give a short and very unsatisfactory answer because of the brevity, and that is this. There is a small number of offenders 
who have periods of psychosis. And there are a lot of questions about this. Number one, were they psychotic at the time of the crime? There is such a thing as a post-confinement psychosis. I'm not talking about faking now. That's real. Secondly, I have interviewed people who have said that voices commanded them to kill. An Arlington County case where a man brought one prostitute after another to his apartment, killed, had sex with them, killed three of them on different nights. He told his defense psychologist that a voice told him to kill. So when I interviewed him, I had no idea whether he'd heard a voice or not. He maintained he had. I said, well, did you ever hear the voice before this? He said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, did, you, did the voice ever tell you to do something, but you were able to disobey the voice? He said, oh, yeah, I could, I could shut down the voice by turning up the radio. Or the voice told me to cut classes, but I went anyway. Or the voice told me not to do something, and I did it. So in more than this one case, they heard voices, or so they said, but they were able to choose whether to heed the voice or not. So really the question is, you, you know, you can have cancer and emphysema. One doesn't cause the other. So the question is, if you are genuinely psychotic and not malingering, and that happens too, did being psychotic impair your ability to appreciate the nature, this is the statute in Virginia, the nature, consequences, and character of your behavior? So I have found two cases, only two, but I'm not in court all the time on insanity cases because there are very few of them, where, yes, I said that the person was mentally impaired, in one case by psychosis and another, it's a longer story, so that he did not know right from wrong. It is very rare, as you know, the, you hear a lot about the insanity defense. It uh, is they plead insanity very seldom, and a tiny number, I don't know what the percentage is, actually are acquitted by reason of insanity. So um, you can be psychotic and you can have a personality disorder as well. One does not necessarily cause the other. Right, right here? Sure. Get in there. And then right after you, the person next to you. You've talked yeah. wonderfully at length about one side of the bell curve, and I cannot help but ask what it ha the, about the other side of the bell curve, where people are, are uh, of known to be, and correctly so, of unusual virtue. Has any study, psychological study, ever been done of unusually good people and what caused their goodness? That's a great question, and the answer is I don't know of any. It doesn't mean it hasn't been conducted. But I will say this, that um, with psychology's emphasis on pathology, uh, there is a guy by the name of Marvin Seligman, who uh, was a former president of the American Psychological Association, who has done research, re reputable research and writing on happiness. So um, that's a happy thought. <laughs> and, and then the person right next to you? Oh, yes. Oh, this is a two-part question about Lee Boyd Malvo. Um, the first part, which has, I, I understand he's trying to get his sentence reduced, if that's correct, and if you could speak to that. But the second part is that people, he may not have been a clean and untarnished stream to start with, but there are instances where two people who are not really great people and might have ended up in jail and done some crime, when you put those two people together, are capable of horrendous things that they would perhaps not have been in, even thought of separately. And I was wondering if you could also speak to that phenomenon. Okay, I got the second one. And when I said that, you know, I don't really know whether Malvo would have been a killer had he not met John Muhammad and been trained and tutored by him, um, that, that's so. I mean, I, I have no way of knowing. I do know that he was a pretty eager student. Oh, I know what the other part of your question was. Lee Boyd Malvo's supposed reformation. I don't know. I mean, I am a psychologist, which means that I certainly believe in the possibility of people changing. Because if I didn't, why should I be in this field? All right? Now, as to whether he has reformed, I have no idea. Please remember that Lee Boyd Malvo 
is a very, very bright person. In fact, in fact, so bright that I remember vividly, and I'll never forget it, I mean I can picture it, talking to him at length for hours at a time in the jail, and he would talk about his favorite film, he would talk about, he, he read the newspaper, only 17, uh, read, some, uh, read the business section, pretty well read, very smart, great vocabulary, and I sat there, and for a moment, I could forget what he did. And this was the trial of um, Linda Franklin, who was killed five minutes from my house in Seven Corners. So, Lee Malvo can be a very persuasive person. I'm just saying that for a few minutes there, you know, it was almost impossible to imagine that he had even done this. So, um, I would be very dubious. He's a very smooth talker, and you know what? He ain't going anywhere, reformed or not. I, I hope for his sake and for the sake of others in the jail that he is reforming. All right. Um, and Peter, this had better be the last question because we actually have people already coming for our noon program. Okay, and I know people have uh, cars parked, so we'll take the last question. I want to make a point of thanking Dr. Samina both for his presentation and he deliberately wanted to leave a good amount of time for questions, and obviously that was very justified. And Peter, you apparently also need to say who you are. People are asking me who you are. No, I did oh, say that. Okay, we sorry can, about that. We can talk about this, yes. Okay, okay. No, sorry. right over there. People ask me who he is. You, this is my staff, I mean, this goes on, okay. Hi, thank you for a very informative talk. Um, while I acknowledge everything you said about uh, errors in thinking, I'm wondering if you've run into people with uh, really bad PTSD or dissociative disorders where uh, their thinking uh, habitually drops out, their cognitions drop out, uh, along the lines of Sapolsky's research, you know, when you're being chased by a tiger, you know, certain things uh, kick in and certain things drop out. I wonder if you run into that at all. Um, very little. The only thing I have to say about this is what I said earlier. You know, you can have cancer and emphysema. One doesn't cause the other. So um, you can have PTSD, and certainly m many, many people who served in Iraq and Afghanistan came back with PTSD. But certainly a tiny minority, I don't know the numbers, but I'm sure it's a tiny minority, have committed criminal offenses. So the question is, is there, would there be a causal link? And um, I would be dubious about that. But I don't really have enough experience with it to say definitively. And I've long learned, if you don't know, say you don't know. Thank you very much. This is Peter Ernest thanking you for coming today and thanking Dr. Seminar. <laughs>